Now for our sermon today, it'll be brought to us by Mr. Barnabas Grayson, and his title is The Past, the Present, and Future. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's really been hot, hasn't it? I'm surprised no one said, how hot is it? <laughs> I knew somebody would. David asked, how hot is it? I saw a robin trying to pull out a worm with oven mitts. Well, it's good to see you all. And uh, I hope I don't speak too long because it looks like I got 35 minutes here and I will try to make that time limit because I know how anxious you are to get back out there in the hot sun. But don't stay out too long. Uh, on the handout that you get, uh, you'll notice that there's a little letter that's left out. I'll leave it up to you to find it. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, about the past and the present, I know that whatever it says uh, there in that scripture, in Ecclesiastes verse 14, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God does it so that men should fear before him. Verse 15, that which has been is now. And that which is to, uh, to be has already been. And God requires that which is past. Now there is a quote that says, those who forget history are condemned to repeat it. This uh, quote is attributed to an American philosopher, George Santoyan, I believe it's pronounced, in 1905. And in other words, you know, like you said, those who cannot remember the past are doomed to forget it. And we can think about how that might apply in today's uh, sermon. But it's a popular quote. It was the writer William Shearer who included it as a citation in his literary work, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, in 1959. So the book was extremely popular, and as such, could have uh, lent a hand in the popularity of that quote. So we know that it was in the beginning that God established his word and his purpose of life. And there are thousands of years to look back on that bears to our present time and also our future. He requires also that we remember those things that we learn from the pages of history or be judged to repeat it. But how easy it is to forget with all the other attractions, distractions of this age today. The pro prophet Daniel, Daniel 9 verse 11 Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is, upon, is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. So as we look around our world today, we see that due to past sins, that there are things that are being poured upon us today. Verse 12, and he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven has not been done as has been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. It's because of a lack of prayer and concern 
for our present state of affairs that we forget that in the past the things that were happened to them could be happening to us today now the first half of the bible we call the old testament the uh, second half we call the new testament but because of this division many think that the old testament is is all but done away but what the old testament gives us today is a bridge to the past that connects to this present age of the new testament era in which christians in which we live now i won't go into all the history the background or anything now there's about 4,000 years of biblical history from the time the creation of man to to the judges and the prophets but then came a gap of about 400 years from the end of the old testament to the beginning of the new testament these were years in which israel and other nations lived under various rulers and despots and so on but still the children of israel in them there was still a looking forward to the return of the messiah and the promises that were made uh, of the time that is to come and all this was during the time of trials and troubles and temptations for all of them religious persecution and confusion political revolts and pagan influences and wars and destruction and death and dying yet they endured and so we have ancestral ties to those who walked in faith with their eye on the promises then as now believers in God are called on to live a godly life to bring up a family to do justice and be a good example to uh, society and it was Micah in chapter 6 verse 8 in the Old Testament who said to the people the Lord has showed you O man what is good and what the Lord requires of you and that is to act justly in love mercy and to walk humbly with your God so we can we can judge society and say well they're going the wrong way but you know they're not looking back into the past into the writings of the prophets of old who gave advice on an instruction and like those of old however we still look to the promises here in the New Testament age overcoming various troubles and trials and deceptions and the fiery darts of Satan the devil the Apostle Paul as well as Matthew uh, Mark they wrote of what Jesus said about this generation in Luke 21 he said in verse 32 verily I say unto you said Jesus this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away now a generation can mean a certain time period or a, a particular people from that time period you know from may, maybe like baby boomers to what is it now generation Z and that have certain characteristics characteristics that can be applied to a certain age but we know that there is a time coming when all things are going to be fulfilled and what things we might ask is those things that Jesus spoke about and said to watch for just as the prophets of old that they foretold our world today especially here in the United States is relatively peaceful prosperous with opportunities for many and we try to look on the right side and sometimes it's hard to do in spite of all the turmoil trying to overlook the turmoil that's going on in various parts of the world Ukraine the Middle East Jerusalem that area and we still hear the sound not literally but we hear the sound of bullets and we hear the sound of those bombs as they come across to us in the news and sometimes I think about because in the neighborhood that we live sometimes on Sunday sometimes in the evening time you hear a staccato of rapid fire or uh, pistols and it's like I can imagine what it would be like if you were in one of these countries to hear those kind of, of deadly sounds now there is a German defense minister I don't, can't remember his name but 
He's saying that they must speedily rebuild the country's military just in case Russia does not stop in Ukraine. So these things can put a damper on life. They can dim our brightness as we look ahead. Yet we know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and that there are promises that the Lord has made. Now we find in the book of Malachi, in the final book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way. If you had your Bible, you could probably underline that, because he was sent to prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. So many took this in as a promise that they could rely on that is going to take place because, after all, the Lord said it, even as we do today. What we see in the words of Scripture, we see the Lord said it. So it has meaning for us in a lot of ways. Then in Malachi chapter 4 on down, there is this prophecy. Verse 1, For behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that comes shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So we look back to these sayings of the prophets, to those promises that we see in Scripture that were given that forms our faith and our belief today. And so from that time on, Jewish leaders, of course, were, they were looking for the Messiah. The people were looking for that prophet to come. Today in Israel, it uh, is always on the mind of the Jewish faithful to rebuild that temple, which would be one of the signs uh, that we are nearing the end of the age. So we see the Old Testament ending with the promise of Elijah to come, which the New Testament identifies as John the Baptist. In John chapter 1, verse 19, these are words from the uh, testimony that John the Baptist gave when the Jews came and wanted to see who he was, what he was talking about. And so, the Jews sent priests and, and Levites from Jerusalem to ask John, are you the Messiah? And he confessed, I am not Christ. I'm not the Messiah. And so they asked him, are you Elias? Are you that prophet? And he said, I am not. Well, who are you then? They asked. And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, just as said the prophet Isaiah, to prepare the way of the Lord. And we know that as we look to the present time, to the past history, and to the future, that we are being prepared for the time to come. Matthew chapter 11, verse 7, and Jesus was talking to the crowd about John the Baptist, and he said, when you went into the wilderness to see John, what did you expect him to be like? Were you expecting to see a man dressed as a prince in a palace or a prophet of God? Yes, and he is more than just a prophet. For John is the man mentioned in the scriptures as my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. That is, you know, to prepare people to receive Christ. Luke chapter 1, verse 16. There is this angel who said to Zacharias about his son uh, John, who is yet to be born, that he shall be great. In the sight of the Lord, he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, and shall he turn even from the uh, womb, and many of the children, children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just 
to make ready a people prepared for the Lord, for the coming of the Lord, for that day that is uh, going to come upon the world. So we see that the gospel of uh, Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, they bring to light those prophetic sayings found in the Old Testament, like the birth of Messiah, Messiah and the establishment of the kingdom of God upon the earth. The, not too long ago, there was, we had the memorial of Christ's death at the Last Supper where he inaugurated the new covenant between God and his people, saying in Luke chapter 22, verse 20, where he said, likewise also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. So this cup symbolizes our covenant with Christ who gave his life for us through him in whom we have forgiveness of our sins and then the promise of everlasting life. But like all those who hear the gospel at first, who hear the good news that's coming, they love what it says, they love what it means. That first love, however, can diminish over time. And we forget the past and what that is supposed to be leading to. So of our time today, as it was written, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we see the attitudes of the last days. They're not, they're, they're bad attitudes, or they're, but, and they're not beatitudes. I'm reading from the Living Bible, Living Bible, and from verse 2, Timothy, uh, Paul telling Timothy, you may as well know this too, Timothy, that in the last days it is going to be very difficult to be a Christian. Do we believe those words or are so far so good, you know, in, in this world today? For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be proud and boastful, sneering at God, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful to them, and thoroughly bad. They will be hard-headed and never give in to others. They will be constant liars and troublemakers and will think nothing of immorality. They will be rough and cruel and sneer at those who try to be good. They will betray their friends. They will be hot-headed, puffed up with pride, and prefer good times to worshiping God. So these past words of the uh, Apostle Paul to Timothy are passed on to us in our present time. That kind of gives us a look toward the future. So this is said to describe the way it has been and is even today and also will be. So we are to be aware so we don't fall in with such attitudes by you know, asking ourselves as we read the, these things in 2 Timothy, does that describe me? Are we one of those things? Verse 12 of uh, 2 Timothy those who decide to please Christ Jesus by living godly lives will suffer at the hands of those who hate him. So, verse 14 says that we must keep on believing the things that you've been taught. You know they are true, for you know that you can trust those of us who have taught you. Over in John chapter 16, Jesus said, Verse 33, these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. So all these words that we read in either the Old or the New Testament, they're there that we might have peace, peace of mind, knowing where to turn when things start turning against us. Because in this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He has fought the battle for us. And those who put their trust, accept uh, his shed blood, have a covenant with him that will see them through. So here on earth, you'll have many trials, you'll have many sorrows, and then you see, but cheer up, rejoice, for I have overcome the world. So we're to press on to the mark and rejoice in the Lord as 
you know, being positive in spite, in spite of the, the negative. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. My little children, these things I write unto you that you don't sin, that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. In his righteousness, righteousness we live. And he knows, as God knows, who his children are and in whom dwells the Holy Spirit. He's the perpetuation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the whole world. And hereby, verse 3, we do know that we know him if, if we keep the commandments. So literally, indeed, in doing, also spiritually, in our mind and in our hearts, thinking the right thing, the right way. So the book of Revelation also tells us what the future holds and what we as a church or individual should give thought to. As mentioned in the Bible study, Onesimus means useful. A word play where Paul said that he was useless to you, but in the, that was in the past, but in the future, he will live up to his name. So there's a lot of things from that Bible study that I listened to. Even though I've studied that a long time ago, there are some things I had forgotten about, had not read, and it's it just like a refreshing course. So I appreciate that, Curtis. So we see that the church at Ephesus was the first of the seven churches addressed in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 through 5, it says to the church there, and this church can represent the characteristics of an individual or a group as a whole. Verse 2, I know your works and your labor and your patience and how you cannot bear them which are evil. And you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. So if we can imagine these words being spoken to us, then we would probably perk up our ears a little more. But when it's, you know, in the pages of Scripture sometimes, it doesn't have the same effect as someone telling you these words. Then, nevertheless, I have something against you because you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence you are fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto you quickly and remove your candlestick out of his place unless unless you repent. So that first love, that first love toward Christ, toward his word, toward the eternal God, toward righteousness, and toward one another is sometimes grows less than at the first. But it's not lost because there is the ending that says unless you repent from the loss of that first love. We just have to examine ourselves and say, where is it that I am slacking up? So being sometimes born uh, bored and have been there, done that kind of attitude, I hate and, you know, hate to get ready to get dressed up and go to church or delight in the Sabbath sometimes. You don't love it like you used to. But we're all carnal-minded at times. Romans 8, verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. So we see why these things happen to us at times. That affects the way we think. Those who are carnal-minded only seek uh, to please themselves. And what's the saying? Whatever uh, floats your boat... Whatever makes you happy, that's the way sometimes we are. But those who are spiritually minded will find themselves doing things, things that are uh, right, rather than doing the wrong that brings on consequences. But we know that this uh, carnally mindedness can mean death if we apply it for a long time in our life. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace, words that we can hold, you know, onto. Okay, I'm not going to be carnally minded because I need peace of mind. I need life. 
So this conflict in mind and heart can be a struggle between doing what is right and doing what is wrong and, and with consequences. But, you know, knowing that you've done the right thing is going to bring comfort, it's going to bring peace. But if we follow our carnal mind, we may say things, do things that aren't right, and carnal mindedness is not pleasing to God. So that is one you know, attitude that we carry with us. Now, it's what I'm doing, it's what I'm thinking. Is that pleasing God? But we all have sins, we all fall, uh, fall down, we all miss the mark. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it is not subject subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So we ask, how can Christians live a righteous life without the daily struggle to keep God's laws? We miss the mark so often, but how does it happen? It's because we forget the goal and we don't apply ourselves. We lose focus because it's sometimes, it's sometimes hard to uh, stay after it. Other things get in the way. You don't feel like it. You don't feel good. In sports, coaches often tell their players to keep your eyes on the, on the ball. And you learn sooner or later that if you take your eyes off the ball, it can be a mistake that can cost the game. I see this a lot sometimes in football where the receiver is wide open and he's got a pass thrown right to him and he's got open field and he knows it. But he takes his eyes off the ball at the last split second and the pass is not completed. That could have won the game or most likely lose the game or the yardage they've gained so far. So that's what happens. You, you make the first and ten or you make the touchdown. You've gained what you needed to. But it's like the Christian life. You take your eyes off the goal because of some trial or trouble that hinders you and makes you not keep your eye on the ball. So in sports, you're usually one of many on a team together to advance and win the game. You know, the, that all for one, one for all, the, the rah, rah, rah that cheer, cheerleaders give. But don't quit until it's over. We may be out, man. We may be behind the score. But you have to stay in the game. And you fight the good fight of faith. Knowing that at the time you may have lost some ground, you still stay in there. Win, lose, or draw. You keep uh, your eye on the goal. It's admirable how some teams are way behind, but they'll still go out and play the game. They know they've lost, but they continue. They, uh, may, uh, maybe the next game will help them come alive again. So we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the perpetuation for our sins, not for ours only, but for the whole world. And hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So the future is still ahead. Christ will return, and he is leading us giving us direction to his, in his word toward the promises of a bright tomorrow, no matter how dim it may look right now in our trials or in our troubles. We might have pain, we might have sorrows, and there is wonder from day to day to the next what will be. So in our look to the future, it's all about having a Christ-like attitude of doing the right things, thinking the right things, overcoming the temptations, and, and fighting the good fight of faith. In Luke, verse 9, But when ye shall hear of wars and commotion, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not yet, but by and by. Verse 20, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. There's a little peek into the future of things that are going to come to pass. Verse 25, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth the distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. 
saw the internet where there, there is a star that has exploded and there's a nova that is supposed to be visible to our eye. They don't know when it's going to appear, but I've never seen a nova. I'm kind of interested to see what it looks like. We'll be off to the, uh, I believe, to the northeast at the tail end of the uh, Big Dipper near Arcturus. Constellation Hercules, what I saw. So uh, this scripture reminds me of that. There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. We see where men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, look up. And lift your heads, for your redemption draweth near, draweth nigh. Likewise, you, when you see these things come to pass, know you that the kingdom of God is near. At times in our troubles and trials, it may seem like he's so far away that he's not answering the prayers that we ask. But verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled. Isaiah 55 says to seek you the Lord while he may be found. Call you upon him while he is near. While he is near. In Psalm 145 verse 18. The Lord is nigh. He's already nigh. Unto all them that call upon him. To all that call upon him in truth. And he will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. But in this day and age, how can we maintain hope and optimism in the face of the troubles and trials? Troubles and trials are not new. They were in Old Testament times, between the Testaments, and in our time today. But this age has so many dis disillusionments, distractions, disunity, disagreements, discouragements, and so on and so on. But it seems like <coughs> doubt and pessimism always seems to work its way into our mind and into our hearts when we face various difficulties and conflicts of all sizes and shapes. And the negatives also seem to outweigh the positives. But let this mind be in you, it says in Scripture. Now there's a hymn most of us are familiar with, and it's called Count Your Blessings which to me means look for the positives. What positives have you turned to when you have faced your own personal trial, your own personal uh, challenge to your beliefs? So what are the blessings that we have that we can count on for our emotional and physical and spiritual support? We can turn to family and friends. We can turn to the church. We can turn to the mater material things that we have or the money, the insurance policy to take care of things, perhaps a good lawyer, perhaps a good doctor, so on and so on, and you can fill in the blank. But is it not the spiritual means that we have that we should look for in prayer, in study, in looking to his word that is, should guide us and direct us? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. This cloud of witnesses, those people we used to know in the past and even from uh, Bible history, we can look to their uh, journey through uh, life and to the times in which they live. So the memory of those who have gone on before us can inspire us, they can encourage us, they can cheer us onward. We can read about them in the, you know, the books of the Old Testament, the prophets, the apostles, even of those who have had their names written in the book of life and await the promise, just as I know that we have. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So when those troubles and trials and doubts and concerns come, you look unto the author and finisher of, your, of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, 
despised the shame and is set down at the right, right hand of the throne of God just as we will be someday there in the kingdom of heaven. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. So the eternal, he sees us, he knows us, he waits for us to make it through. He looks down upon the sons of men and on humankind. And he sees what so many of us see today. People who are lost, losing their way. There are so many people, young and old, imprisoned in their own minds or maybe out on the streets, booted from their homes, mar or no home, no place to go, no place to call home, to lay their head, or to have something to eat. They all have a past. But for now, they wander. They wander the street, wondering what their future holds. And there are those tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. In conclusion, that which has been is now. And that which is to be has already been. And God requires that which is past. So we can't forget the past, but to remember it, learn the lessons from history, Ezekiel, I mean Ecclesiastes 3, 14, 15. So look at where we are as a person, as a church called out, and as a nation. Don't forget where we are going, where we're coming from, knowing that the eternal still speaks to us through his word. And when we are hit with trials and troubles, count your blessings. Fight the good fight of faith, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. As Micah said in verse 8 of chapter 6 in Micah, the Lord has showed you what is good and what the Lord requires of you, and that is to act justly and love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So press on to the mark and rejoice in the Lord.